I'm John Fensterwald, writer of the blog, educated guest, and editor of toped.org, a forum on California education policy. Join me while I interview interesting and important leaders in California education. You'll learn a lot in 10 minutes or less. I'm fortunate to have with us today Larry Cuban, who's a former high school uh, social studies teacher, superintendent, and for 20 years, uh, professor of education at Stanford. He's the author of many books and articles, including his latest, of which he's a co-author. It is Cutting the Hype, the Essential Guide to School Reform. So welcome, Larry. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, John. So uh, Larry, what's the hype? What's that all about? Uh, the hype is the constant uh, exaggerated talk, the hyperbole that goes along with reform. Uh, this reform is going to be a panacea. One size fits all. That constant exaggeration is what the hype is. Now you've observed um, uh, movements, reform movements over many decades, yes. you know, back to the 50s and Sputnik and, and, and the 80s and standards. And so how does this, what we're going through now, how does that compare with what you've seen over the last 50 years? It's, uh, it's been compressed. Jane David and, my, uh, and I, Jane is the co-author, mm -hmm. and it was basically her idea and her title, Cutting Through the Hype. Uh, it is much more compressed now, and it, the, the lifespan of these reforms is short. So that what used to be Sputnik began uh, in 57, 58, and had a kind of a, a fairly long run until the early to mid-60s. Some of these reforms, boom, they're here, and boom, they're gone. And some of them, I see, are back. And they come back. Teachers often say, if you stay in the same spot, it'll return. So you've looked at 23 reforms, and the interesting thing about your book, it's a, it's a practical guide for general lay readers, too, not just uh, the policy wonks. And um, about four or five pages on each topic. And, and, and let me go through uh, performance-based pay, uh, urban mayors in charge, ending social promotion, more time in school, smaller classes, charter schools, small schools, turnaround strategies, and on and on. So, um, and, and again, you've been a wise skeptic on this uh, in looking at that. And one of the things that you say is the gap between policy and practice remains vast. So what do you mean by that? Basically, uh, a top policymaker from the President of the United States to U.S. Congress or in California, uh, the legislature and the governor, they will make a policy. They adopt the policy. There's a lot of talk around it and everything. But by the time the policy works its way into the classroom, there are a lot of links in that chain. And by that time, there are a lot of broken links. So it's like that old telephone game uh, where you whisper in the ear right. of someone, and by the time it comes out, it's very different. Right. That's the policy to practice linkage. Well, I like one of the quotes you have in your book. You say, reform advocates and increasingly corporate and foundation leaders uh, shape school reforms based on some combination of ideology, best guesses, and hope. Seldom are those who must carry out the reform principals and teachers involved in their design. And I, I'm I'm inferring from that that involvement in teachers and, and principals uh, is critical. Uh, it is. Uh, it's, it's reform done to rather than with. And that, has been the, uh, and that has been the case when teachers and principals have been involved for decades. This is not new. This is uh, it, it, what is occurring now being done to has been the, the pattern. Uh, and of course, if you ask Who's going to, policymakers don't teach. Governor Schwarzenegger doesn't teach. The legislature, they don't teach. Teachers and the principals do the daily work. Mm -hmm. And if they are not involved in any decisions about, and I mean uh, meaningfully involved, then you can't expect uh, a policy that is adopted to have to be faithfully implemented in the classrooms. It just won't happen that way at all. So. Um, for your readers, you sort of broken down, uh, given advice for a reader to look at, a, look at a reform and say, ask three basic questions. And those questions are, does a reform make sense? Can a reform actually work in the classroom? 
and are the conditions for reform in place? And um, I wonder if you could take a minute and talk about each. And in, in terms of does a reform make sense, you say avoid funnel vision, which I like. Yeah, uh, the, the funnel vision is that, uh, that there's only one way to do that and that uh, you're so focused on that. We also say, don't believe the hype. Kick the tires. That's about making sense. Kick the tires basically uh, means that uh, does the reform uh, do what it says it's going to do? Uh, avoid the hype. Uh, again, this kind of exaggerated. If it's too good to be true, it probably is false. So well, can we take one of the 23 that you sure. talked about, just say um, small urban high schools, which was okay. a wave of interest in that. Yeah. And so um, using those three questions, what can a reader look at small urban high schools to say, does it work? Did it work? What can, did it benefit at all? Yeah, I would say the small urban high schools, by and large, uh, pushed by uh, the, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and, uh, and state and federal policymakers has had an enormous influence on urban high schools. Uh, the New York example, uh, the LA example, charters, a lot of these small high schools have been a real boon to urban uh, minority youth. There's no question in my mind about it. Has it improved achievement? Well, according to Bill Gates, when they pulled some of the funding from it, not as much as they had hoped. Has it made it a different environment for uh, minority youth and kids who would ordinarily not have achieved in larger high schools? The answer is yes, from uh, the point of view of Jane David and myself. Yeah. One of the things that you mentioned is that, in fact, uh, reformers shouldn't abandon too soon if they run into a rough patch. Uh, and reformers are going to run into rough patches. That's the nature of it. It could be budget retrenchment. It could be that uh, the teachers and principals have to have their skills uh, and knowledge uh, worked with through professional development. A lot of the things that about the conditions for success is that a lot of policymakers are less concerned about that. I mean, you do need certain knowledge and skills to do a lot of these very complex things. The teaching of phonics is close to rocket science, and a lot of people mm. don't realize that. And Teachers and principals need to have the capacity that they have uh, stretched in order to do those kinds of things. So now in California, we're running into a severe budget. I yeah. mean, everyone knows the state of the budget's gonna be worse next year. So should we temper reforms, abandon reforms, put them off, postpone? I think more being more selective about them. Mm -hmm. What you have is a kind of Chinese menu of choices about reforms, and what we need to do is be more selective, particularly around teachers. I think the focus on teachers and any reforms that help teachers teach, uh, expand their capacity and knowledge and skills, is what I would focus on in a period of retrenchment. Okay. Um, well, Larry Cuban, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us today. And, uh, and let me say that Larry has, besides the book, Cutting Through the Hype, which I recommend uh, for all readers. Uh, Larry has a blog, which is uh, LarryCuban.wordpress.com. I recommend that as well. Thank you for coming, joining. Thank today. you, John. Right. John Fensterwald, educated guest and toped.org. Thanks for watching.